Tell me if you've seen this before, an ad or story about GMOs where they use images like this. That's some eye-grabbing stuff, to be sure. But here's the thing. That's not what GMOs are. Scientists don't take tomatoes into their lab and inject them with a syringe. That's just an image cooked up in a marketing department to put something cool looking on TV or in a newspaper. So, okay, for all the noise and misinformation like that out there, what exactly are GMOs? When nature, and, and I should say breeding, is based on natural evolution, natural evolution is very, very slow. So whereas nature might take 350,000 years to create an enzyme that performs a certain task, we can do this in the laboratory in 18 months. Professor Eleanor Wurzel is a scientist at Lehman College, and she gave us a crash course in genetics. You see, there are only a few ways genes can change. One is evolution. Somewhat faster is selective breeding, say, a farmer cross-pollinating two bigger tomatoes so that the offspring has a greater chance of being big too. And of course, recently, genetically modifying organisms directly, GMOs. The DNA provides the instructions for the plant to make its components, its chemicals. So the instructions are not so important. It's the product that's important. Indeed, that's all genes really are, instructions to tell a plant what to do. To take a step back and dust off our high school biology class notes a bit here, all DNA molecules are made up of the same four building blocks, adenine, thymine, cytosine, and guanine, ATCG. The genes that make a rattlesnake venomous or a tomato juicy or Michael Jordan good at basketball, all of them are made up of the same A, T, C, and G, just in very different combinations. The point being, no matter what food we eat, the most genetically modified GMO or the most naturally organic grown, the genetic material we're eating is the same A, T, C, and G, no matter where we got it from. The food itself is just as real, no matter what the instructions it had. It's just a question of what those instructions are. Imagine a farmer has a tomato plant, beautiful fruit, but it does not grow in poor soils. It has another plant that has a horrible fruit, but grows in poor soils. Now, the molecular biologist figured out the gene that is necessary for making the beautiful fruit and knows it's a single gene if they put this into the plant that makes the, um, you know, the horrible fruit but can grow in, in, in poor soils, they have the perfect combination. A single gene, they can go in the laboratory, they know exactly which gene has been introduced. Very simple. That's a GMO product. Now, if a farmer wants to get the same tomato by using traditional crossbreeding, they too are trying to get just that gene changed. In a sense, that already is genetically modifying. However, when you crossbreed, you may get the gene you want, sure, but you're also getting all the other genes from the rest of the plant along with it. So it's not only going to take a lot of generations of breeding to get the tomato you want, but you may also be getting a lot of genes you don't want. We call it genetic drag. The breeder was selecting by his uh, visual assessment of the plants, but doesn't know what else is coming along for the ride. Toxins, allergens, who knows? That's traditional breeding. So I would say that with GMO, we have an opportunity to make our plants good for us. So we don't have to worry about allergens or toxins in the plant. We know exactly what gene has been introduced. Now that's not at all to dismiss traditional farming or breeding. To the contrary, the point is, they have all proven useful to our agriculture, and just as importantly, proven safe. No matter where the genes come from in a food, the genes are all made from the same A, T, C, and G, after all. Now, to be sure, there are plenty of valid criticisms of the agriculture industry. But as with any science, it's the application that is the key. So when it comes to cutting through the marketing noise around GMOs, Professor Wurzel says, at the end of the day, it's all about better communication between scientists and informed consumers. And if they don't feel they're part of the process, then they will be very suspect of something like GMO. And hopefully that won't happen in the future.
breaking down the information and misinformation about GMOs. I'm Ari Goldberg for Simply Science.